So I really want to talk about the intellectual dark web, which now is probably nearly two years old, since it was kind of formally unveiled in the New York Times in the um, Barry Weiss article. And we've obviously featured the IDW quite a lot on Rebel Wisdom. We've kind of looked at it, like I, I was really fascinated by it from the beginning, the, the idea of, I think when we first talked, um, you, you said something about how all truths must align. Is that your? All true narratives must reconcile. All true narratives must reconcile. So from the outset, I kind of had this idea of, um, could we have like the, these public conversations where these different sort of maps of the world, for example, like Jordan Peterson's Jungian perspective, evolutionary biology, is there, a, is there alignment? Is there a way that these can come together? And there's this sort of sense of, excite, I'd say a sense of real excitement at the beginning. Some of those first encounters on the Rubin Report, um, you and Eric, um, Jordan and Ben Shapiro, there's this sort of sense of a really alive conversation that's going somewhere new and this sense of novelty. I think we called it kind of thinking in public. And I know that we've talked before about the need for there to be spaces where people feel comfortable enough to be honest and that the IDW was a place where you could actually kind of uh, manufacture that kind of safety. And I think that's all of that's really, really valuable. But I also have this sense that certainly over the last couple of years, some of that for me, there hasn't been as much novelty. And I've also did a talk recently at, at, at a university in America where I sort of talked about where I saw some of the failure points or some of the places where the IDW didn't necessarily push on to, to a new resolution. I'd love to ask a few questions about that. Um, what's, your, what's your sense of the trajectory of the IDW and where it's at now in 2020? Well, I have to say, to be candid, I miss the IDW. I feel like the IDW was a very interesting, dynamic place to be, and it isn't gone, but I also don't see it being active. And I must say I'm concerned about what that means. You know, if it's taking a break and going to reemerge in some sense, then that's all well and good. On the other hand, I worry that the, the IDW space did not fully understand what threatened it and that the fact that it is, uh, it is a quiet space at the moment might be reflective of forces we, we didn't understand. Now, of course, there's also a certain amount of happenstance in that, obviously, Jordan Peterson has had uh, a health crisis uh, along with his wife. Tammy, and that has taken him out of the public eye uh, for a period of time, and that has obviously had an impact on the space. But it's not the only thing that, um, that we encountered. And anyway, I'd like to see the IDW or some outgrowth of it return and pick up where the lively IDW that we remember left off. Because mm. this is one other thing that I've been sort of tracking since the beginning. I think the, for me, the naming of the IDW, the naming of the intellectual dark web, was sort of the coming to consciousness, and I'd love to hear if you agree with this or you'd have a different perspective, was the kind of the coming to consciousness of the alternative media space as an entity in itself. But you had this, you had a lot of podcasters, a lot of uh, personalities like Sam Harris, Joe Rogan, who become very popular in sort of growing in the shade or in between the cracks of the mainstream media and the naming of the intellectual dark web was a way of sort of saying, oh, it, it's now a thing. There, there is actually a thing and there is another center of power that is distinct from the mainstream media. And it, and it showed up maybe a lot of the flaws in the things that the mainstream media weren't talking about, but also what, what I think we've seen as well is sort of an evolution of what the expectations are of, of an entity that now has a, an equal, or maybe even some, in some places more power than to shape narratives in the mainstream media does. So in a way, would you, would you agree with that, that it was sort of the naming of, a, of, of maybe a, an emergent entity that hadn't previously been named? And that's why the, the, the name, the intellectual dark web, sort of took off and you saw a lot of, it had a, a strong mimetic potential. Well, I think, 
I'm sometimes faulted for always seeing things in biological terms, but I would argue that almost all the things that I see that way are actually biology or a manifestation of it. In this case, what you have is a niche space where a completely corrupt and broken media apparatus left everybody in kind of a low level of constant starvation for anything authentic and decent and unexpected. And certain folks were exploring that space. Joe Rogan pioneered uh, an entire mechanism for interacting with that space, as did Sam Harris. Dave Rubin was uh, creating an entirely distinct mechanism of inhabiting that space. And at the point that Intellectual Dark Web was named by Eric, in effect, what I think he was doing was describing a phenomenon that was quietly evolving in this niche. And the niche is still there because, of course, the hunger is still there. The media hasn't gotten any better. In fact, it's still playing the same games that it was playing in 2017. But the question of what inhabits that space has become more complicated for various different reasons. I mean, one of them simply being that there is now wide recognition that there is a space, and that means maybe for both better and worse that there is an economic opportunity in that space, which lots of economic entities are now trying to capitalize on. So that's now a hazard that was um, much smaller a couple of years ago um, by virtue of the fact that most people weren't aware of it. And what do you mean by that? What what are you seeing coming in? Are you talking about the sort of the idea of the grifter, or no? Actually, grifters weren't anywhere on my mind, though. That's obviously a manifestation of the same process. That there are grifters who will learn what messages are resonant amongst the audience of the IDW and start parroting them for cynical reasons. That's certainly a phenomenon we've seen. But there's also um, a recognition amongst very standard economic entities that there are eyeballs that are searching for authentic content of a counterintuitive type and that many of them have ended up in IDW space and, you know, what can we do with that? It's just the simple standard uh, question that capitalism is always pointing at everything, which is how can we turn that into a profit? And anyway, there's nothing inherently wrong with profitability, but the fact that there's profit to be made threatens to do to IDW space what it did to journalism. And anyway, I think the one advantage that uh, IDW space has is that maybe it's aware that it is supposed to be the alternative to a broken media, and that offers the possibility of resisting. And how would you define IDW space? Because that was another point that I made in the, in the talk, was that there, there does seem to be a lot of energy and desire in, and certainly around the time when it was named, among a lot of people for good faith dialogue, for discussion of these kind of issues, and it it never feels like it didn't doesn't feel like it ever quite went beyond the the people who were named in that initial article and became more of a kind of cultural or public movement. So first, let's talk a little bit about what IDW space is. IDW space, as far as I can tell, is a um, an environment in which the priority is put on stating what one actually believes, irrespective of the social consequences of those statements, and of partnering in discussion with other people on the basis that you hold um, the discovery of truth to be a higher value than pushing your own agenda. And I think the IDW to me, it was a prototype of something, and it was a highly successful prototype. Um, the question then is, once you have a highly successful prototype of discussions in which people prove that they are capable of 
uh, updating on the basis of new information, capable of delivering their own perspective even if it puts them in jeopardy, uh, all of those characteristics, what do you do to bring others in? Because now the world is alerted to the fact that there is something with a lot of eyeballs on it. So the desire to figure out how to get into that conversation is very high and the danger of people entering it for the wrong reasons is through the roof. So you have to solve the question of how to broaden the discussion so that it remains dynamic and adds new elements without killing it by virtue of opening the doors and the so-called quality control uh, dropping through the floor. And there has to be some way of uh, making the conversation modular so that failures do not take down the space itself. And I'm not sure we've figured out the answer to that question yet. I would love to see the, the problem addressed. But um, I think at this moment, where we are is we've seen a beautiful proof of concept. We've seen that people resonate with it, that it solves a problem, that there are lots of things that could be said amongst members of the IDW, things that need to be said, that are still difficult to say in more mainstream circles, and to the extent that people can uh, bootstrap a conversation that is more capable, more dynamic, more honest, um, and live to tell the tale, we need to foster. And I mean, one of the things that I've noticed as well is that if this is more of a web-based um, insurgency, and I'd say that it probably is, the failure conditions online are very different from the failure conditions of the mainstream media. In the mainstream media, you get a group think, you get um, kind of the fact that every, everyone is kind of coming from the same universities, they're all in the same environments on the coasts. What I see different in the, in the online space is this idea that almost the platforms themselves are weaponized because you know by going on a certain platform, you're exposed to their audience, like you've got a comments thread underneath every YouTube. So every single platform there seems to be subject to these very centrifugal forces pulling to one side or the other. And that, for example, you have on one side, you've got someone like Sam Cedar, who like, you can just see they're, they're sort of beating up on, on Dave Rubin and beating up on Sam Harris and beating up on sort of these figures because they know that's what their audience wants. Like you have very different failure conditions in the online space. Like, you, and you can feel that gravitational force of the audience, especially on on YouTube, which sort of, for me, leans right because often those kind of perspectives are not given space in the mainstream media. Like this is something that's really, um, I think, worth pulling apart. What, what, what do you make of that? It's almost like you've sped up some of these failure conditions for, for online media. Well, at some level, we're damned every which way. I think one of the things about uh, social media space, the positive thing about it, was that it allowed something like the IDW to happen and for there to be an awareness of just how resonant it was. Imagine for a second a world in which social media existed, but YouTube videos did not have a comments thread. Uh, tweets did not have a measure of how many people had resonated with them or passed them along, right? Then the IDW would have been mocked as a insignificant, unsuccessful group of self-important whatevers. The fact that so many people responded to it, the fact that on tweets from members of the IDW, you would, you would get hundreds or thousands of people responding positively when if you go to the, you know, the anchors of a major news program, you'd find 10 or 20 at most uh, indications of interaction. That said, whatever is going on here, this is actually an important social force. It can't be ignored. You can throw epithets at it. You can say it's a gateway to the alt-right or whatever other kinds of nonsense were tossed around, but you can't say that it's falling flat. And so my point is, yes, the tendency of social media to create gravitational forces that pull people who are 
living in that space in one direction or the other, that's a very dangerous phenomenon. And it's even more dangerous if the directions people are being pulled in are not organic. If something decides to use social media to pull people in some direction they wouldn't otherwise go, that's very dangerous. So it is critically important that people in that space figure out how to think independently of their audiences. So if their audience begins to pull them in some direction that's not really of their organic belief, they don't go and they accept the social cost of not going. But not having the feedback that comes from people's organic interactions online is even more dangerous in my opinion. So we've got sort of audience capture on the one hand and um, lack of feedback and the ability to snuff out promising things by pretending that they're not reaching anyone. Those are two alternate failure conditions. It's interesting to see those, those two sides because I can remember when, I think it was either you or uh, it might have been when I talked to Eric originally about the IDW, the idea was that these people would be immune from some of the failure conditions of the mainstream media because they had their own platforms, they were small operators. But for me, that feels kind of naive because you're going to be subject to the whims of your audience. You're going to realize what your audience want. You're going to give them what they want to some degree. So there are going to be new failure conditions for online media that, and I've been like critical of Dave Rubin quite a few times in the past as being, for me, kind of the, um, the obvious example of that, recognizing what the audience wanted and then kind of just giving them more and more of that. Sam Harris, on the other hand, has sort of very deliberate, because he talks a lot about Islam, he's kind of recognized that he's sometimes getting kind of um, some bigoted people following him and he's sort of very careful to try and throw them off as, as much as possible by talking about how, he, how much he dislikes Trump, for example. It, there's a whole new set of kind of ethical and failure conditions that come in as being a, a media personality in this sort of new online world. Um, I guess, what do you make of that and how do you personally respond to that? Well, there is a characteristic that a very small percentage of people have, which I think is disproportionately important in this space. And it is a deafness to social gravity and it is a willingness to endure social harm for a cause or a truth. And so to the extent that I'm looking out across this landscape, if somebody does not demonstrate this capacity, even if they're saying something I resonate with, they're uninteresting to me because I know it's only a matter of time before they get sucked into some gravity well around some social truth that isn't deep. On the other hand, if somebody is um, essentially immune to the epithets, if somebody will go down with the ship, think, well, I know this to be true, and if the whole world disagrees with me, that doesn't make it any less true, so therefore you're not going to get me to, to claim anything else, then that person is um, interesting because they are independent. So I think the IDW space brought forward a number of people who have this unusual characteristics uh, to a highly unusual degree. I don't think it was everybody who was associated with the space and there is this danger. But in general, I think the lesson or the meta lesson of IDW is that that characteristic is disproportionately important as society becomes uh, false. And so the reason that the hunger was so great, the reason that the resonance of the IDW was so great, and um, the discovery of the process that unfolded in the couple of years after was that we need to figure out how to cultivate this ability to say what's true when it's awkward, when it's um, socially damning, and that we also uh, need to figure out how to value and promote people who have that characteristic so that they do find their way into mainstream media, for example. Because in, in a way, in, in the social media environment, we're all content creators anyway. So being able to say something that's going to get you mobbed on Facebook is probably, like by your friends and family and people close to you, is probably a process that a lot of people have gone through. 
which is maybe why a lot of people resonated with the IDW, because on some level, a lot of people feel that they have skin in the game on this, because we've, we've all got the chance of being kind of socially mobbed or uh, excluded or um, shamed, humiliated on social media. I, I think that's true. Many people have had the experience, and I think it's very disheartening if you come to the conclusion that having been mobbed, you must have been wrong. You must have made an error. And seeing people who reject that and live to tell the tale or actually end up looking good because they resist the mob, um, that's a very positive lesson for people. So, you know, the amount of gratitude that flowed from people seeing successful resistance against the nonsense was, uh, was, was quite rewarding. Sometimes I will look at a tweet before I post it and I will think, yep, that one's going to get me in trouble. That's going to be costly. Or I know there's a certain fraction of my audience that is going to rebel against that very idea and probably walk away. And then there's also, you know, the next thought is, yeah, but do you believe it? Should you not post that tweet because you think people are going to walk away? And then the next thing is click, and you post it. Um, because, you know, you're in a dialogue with yourself. Do I want to be captured by my audience? No, I don't. And that means that if my not audience needs to hear something, that I believe, even if I'm not looking to convince them necessarily, I just need them to know that somebody that they consider reasonable actually holds this belief, which they do not hold, and they think no reasonable person holds. That thing needs to be stated. And so um, the willingness to endure the cost of stating that which needs to be said um, is again incredibly important and the difficult lesson is that the reaction, the rebellion is very concentrated and the reward, if it comes at all, will be delayed, it will be diffuse, it will be difficult to detect what it's about. But when people see you again and again say stuff that somebody needed to say, even if they disagree with it, the best people will respond positively to that, whether they agree with you or not. So we mentioned at the beginning something you'd said about all true narratives must reconcile. And I wonder whether I personally had too much. So the IDW at one, on one level was showing that people of different perspectives could have, com could have meaningful conversations that uh, meant that they weren't falling out, they weren't becoming polarized, they, weren't, they, they were still able to be friends at the end of the day. But my hope beyond that was that there might be some shift, there might be some kind of public changing of mind, public, um, evidence of this kind of process of thinking that then led towards this all true narratives reconciling. And I was, I have been quite disappointed not to have seen that from the IDW conversations. We can talk about what, why that wasn't the case. But do you think it was a naive expectation that that might happen? Or do you think it was a missed opportunity? I don't think it was either. Uh, I believe in a sort of fractal hierarchy of timescales. Mm -hmm. And there are things which we detect on very short timescales which are important. If somebody changes their mind inside a conversation, it's very dramatic. Um, if they change their mind over the course of six months or a year, it's still fairly dramatic. If it takes four years, it's much more subtle and harder to track. And I'm tracking all sorts of conversations that I was participating in over the last several years, and I do see them moving. Um, so there was a discussion between Brian Greene and, uh, and Joe Rogan recently in which they were discussing um, their views on religion. And I don't know what Brian Greene's position was several years ago. But I know Joe's because I spoke to him about it on his podcast. And he was, he had moved substantially. I don't know if Joe realizes it, but he had moved substantially in the direction of what I think is now becoming a mainstream understanding, which is that religions may be literally false, but they evolve for a reason. They exist for, um, the very fact that they served our ancestors. 
Now, we haven't gotten publicly to the next phase of that discussion, which is what is their status, right? And I'm afraid that's going to be a difficult one. But I've seen people on both the religious side move in the direction of a adaptive explanation for religious belief, and I've seen people on the atheist side move in the same direction. So if you're tracking that conversation um, broadly, you do see the movement. If you're waiting for somebody to acknowledge a transition over some short period of time, you often don't detect it. So what I would say is what we really need to figure out is what our benchmarks are. What can be stated in 2020, right? Is that benchmark in the same place in 2022? Have we backslid? Have we made progress? Are we capable of saying difficult things in, uh, in a wider space in that period? And my feeling is I've seen the conversation move in a positive direction. I've also seen the backlash intensify, but the movement in the positive direction is clearly there if you're paying attention to, uh, to certain hallmarks. One of the things that I've also seen, and I'd love to get your take on it, because I know that this is one of your phrases that bad faith changes everything in a conversation. This seems like a very interesting point, like the conversation, the bad faith, good faith, because it's often used and I've seen it used often now as a way of sort of policing who can take part in discussions, who you're willing to have on your show, for example. And there seems to be no obvious um, definition. Like bad faith is almost always something that someone will say about someone else, but it will never be, no one, no one would accept that um, description of themselves. So how can you define bad faith and good faith? And how can you know whether and how do you know if that's being used erroneously as a way of keeping someone out of the conversation who should actually be part of the conversation or should challenge you in some way? Yeah, that's a good question. I would say a couple things. One, there is an issue with certain parameters that they fail at the point you attempt to operationalize them. So to the extent that good faith has a value in conversation, it may be true that just simply recognizing that there is something, even if we can't be certain if we detect it, that there is a state and we can define it, and that that state ought to distinguish between your viability in a conversation and the need to bar you from it. So I would say, loosely speaking, good faith, not as lawyers use the term, because it has a very particular uh, uh, definition as a term of art in the law, but. Um, in common parlance, I would say the, the sin qua non of good faith is whether or not a person is acting uh, with reference to the goal that they state. In other words, if somebody says, this is my objective, and then they say something or take an action with the earnest belief that they are actually moving towards that objective, that's good faith, even if they're wrong, even if what they're doing is monstrous, just the simple fact that they are telling you Here's the objective, and then the action matches the objective. What people do that is not in good faith is they provide a misleading objective. That's the easiest place to mislead. And then they pretend that their statements or their actions are actually an attempt to reach that objective when really they're an attempt to reach some unstated objective. So can you detect this? Yes, you can detect it. Can you do so absolutely reliably? No, but if you have enough data on a particular individual's behavior, bad faith becomes evident over time because believing in X could not possibly result in these statements and behaviors, which are counterproductive with relevance uh, with respect to the the objective. So you know, bad faith emerges. Can you detect bad faith suddenly? Can somebody do something that calls your attention to the likelihood that they're acting in bad faith? Yep, you can definitely see it. Could you be mistaken? That can happen also, but that will also become clear over time. So what I would say is somebody who is um, sensitive to uh, tracking the match of a model to the actual manifest behavior can see these things. And it's actually not unlike what we do in animal behavior animals, non-human animals, they never tell you what they're up to, 
right? You have to be able to figure it out based on the fact that you have a model. This is what I think the animal is trying to accomplish. And then if I watch the animal continuing to behave, its behavior matches that objective. Or here's what I think is happening and then no, actually what it's doing wouldn't make any sense if that's what it was trying to accomplish. So it must be trying to accomplish something different. This is the same thing. It's basically uh, ethnology versus ethology. So in this context, I guess the, the key distinctions we're making in sort of conversation is, are you oriented towards truth or are you oriented to, to winning, winning the interaction and making the other person look bad? Well, I Would that no, be a key distinction? Or? I, have I have no problem with somebody. Somebody is not inherently acting in bad faith if they're trying to win and make the other person look bad, as long as they acknowledge that that's what they're up to, mm -hmm. right? But if somebody says, look, I am much more interested in discovering the truth than winning, and then they behave like somebody who's more interested in winning than discovering the truth, that's bad faith. It's the mismatch between the objective and uh, the apparent objective and the stated objective. So I don't really have any interest in participating with somebody who's just looking to score points. But uh, the challenge that they are acting in bad faith really depends on the fact that they don't admit that that's what they're doing. I guess the complexity for me is that very few people are actually, a lot of people who think they're acting in good faith and get very upset if you say, no, you're a, you're a bad faith actor, genuinely don't know or can't tell that that's what they're doing. Like I could probably, we could probably come up with two or three names of people who would be very, very upset if you said you're actually a bad faith actor and genuinely believe that, that's, that they're actually trying to kind of approach truth and would argue that that's what they're trying to do. So how do you get past this just being a subjective judgment by someone who maybe doesn't want to engage? Well, first of all, let us be clear. I think a lot of people make the error that because they believe their motives to be positive, that that is the same thing as acting in good faith. And the problem is it's very easy to rationalize behaviors that are um, harmful to others and to paint some sort of positive spin on them. So it's not a question of whether your internal motives are decent. Um, that's an important question, but there's too much room for rationalization for us to figure it out. But um, really, a mismatch between your stated objective and the objective revealed by your behaviors is certainly reason for a red flag. Um, this also means that you have an obligation to search your own mind to discover if in fact there's a, a rationale for your behavior that you're not aware of or only dimly aware of and you're keeping it out of your own sight in order to prevent um, the knowledge of it from causing you to be guilty of bad faith. But a person who is willing to search their own mind and say, look, I don't know for sure I'm a human being, which means that most of what goes on in my head is invisible to me too. But to the extent that I check my own motives, it's not that I'm privately aware of something and pursuing it and not telling you about it. As far as I know, what I'm saying is my actual belief and it is based on the things that I've told you it's based on. Now, what we do with the difference between the abstract question, does bad faith exist? It absolutely does. Does something else exist that we might call good faith? It absolutely does. Can you detect these things from the outside? Yes but it takes a pattern, right? Um, what do we do with the accusation? So we've got the personal fact of acting in good or bad faith. We've got the uh, suspicion by somebody else based on a pattern of behavior. And then we've got the accusation, which might be used to keep somebody out of a discussion. And the problem is, we can't convict somebody of bad faith unless there's really substantial evidence that they are stating an incorrect motive, that they have reason to know that that's what they are doing, or if they don't know that they've been avoiding it so as not to know, right? Those are, are the issues. Um, but we never have, or almost never have, the level of proof that would exist for convicting a person of a crime, for example. Did you commit the crime? The evidence says beyond a reasonable doubt that you did, right? That's something we can prove. But when we're talking about your internal motivation, it's much harder to prove. And so 
Um, as a bar, uh, we have to understand that we are not really um, claiming the right to exclude somebody from a public good. But in a conversation, I'm not participating in a public good. I'm participating in a conversation whose very nature depends on the ability to exclude that which is counterproductive. If I suspect somebody is acting in bad faith and I don't want them in a conversation that I'm participating in, then the point is, well, I don't want to participate in that conversation if that person is present. So my participation is contingent on those that I suspect are not acting in good faith and not being present for it. You don't want to watch that conversation? Don't watch it, right? This isn't like I'm saying that person can't come into a public park because they're acting in bad faith. I guess the other question, and this may sound very naive, but um, is it always necessary to exclude those who you, can, who you suspect might be bad faith or might sometimes be bad faith from conversations? Or can, on one level, why not have the conversation with them and call it out in real time and let the audience make up their minds? Uh, that can be useful, but I would say there's a simple question of opportunity cost. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have time in the rest of my life for even all of the conversations I might have with people who are very careful about their own motivations and very earnestly motivated to do positive things in the world. There's just a limit on how many hours there are left. Should I spend some of those hours engaging with people who are being deceptive about their own beliefs? Maybe. Maybe you I... be able to expose them, for example. Well, sure. I, I'd be willing to do that, but then I wouldn't exactly bar them from a conversation. If my purpose was to expose their bad faith, I would agree to participate in it. So on rare occasion, it may make sense to have those conversations, but in general, the ability of a person acting in bad faith to snarl a conversation so that it goes nowhere productive is much greater than the ability of somebody acting in good faith to establish what's really going on in somebody else's head or that they're a charlatan or whatever. So um, we should spend our time where it's productive. And in general, uh, my experience tells me that interacting with people who are acting in clear good faith is far more productive. And I know that I know that from both you, I know that both from your perspective and from Eric's perspective. I mean, your background is evolutionary biology. Eric has got a background in physics. The IDW as a concept was actually a part of a much broader perspective of there are all of these. There are many narratives in society. We're stuck on many different vectors and many different perspectives. And the IDW was actually sort of the the public face of that conversation was kind of the media branch of that conversation. Um, and obviously quite an important part because it's the, sort of the sense making part that maybe then has a reflection on all these different levels. Um, where do you feel that we're at in terms of shifting that broader conversation? Uh, let me see if I understand what you're getting at. There is a false narrative and a control over what gets discussed that manifests in various different places. Mm -hmm. People may have seen my recent Portal episode with Eric in which we talked about the question of telomeres, senescence, and cancer, and in particular we talked about the issue of the evolution of long telomeres in laboratory mice, which has tremendous implications for, among other things, drug safety testing. That question is clear. It's been on the table for many years, and as far as I know, it's unaddressed um, by the field. Why? I don't know. But the, the pattern that becomes apparent is that every field has bodies buried under some set of floorboards, and deep insiders know where those things are, and they do not get discussed in public, and the um, those of us on the outside suffer whatever consequences we do as a result of the fact that these fields are not owning up to what they know. IDW was a manifestation, in a sense, of a certain set of issues that were being poorly discussed in the academy and in media space, and it was composed of people 
who were willing to pay the price to discuss what was really going on um, in these fields. I don't think the fields in general have gotten any better, but what has gotten better is that the awareness in the public that something seems to be wrong across the board, that whatever mechanism we are using, the way the market plugs into our academic fields and our media environment and our courts is not resulting in a pretty good description of reality on which you can mostly depend, which is what it pretends it's doing. It's resulting in a really crappy representation of reality on which you cannot depend. So the fact that in 2017, 18, 19, you have mobs of people challenging folks who are saying things that obviously have truth in them, as if those people were speaking uh, diabolical untruths. That results in independent-minded people standing up and saying, no, you've got it wrong. I, I don't care what you're peddling, but you, you don't have it right. And so the... Um, the witch hunting that became common started to surface people who, in the face of a witch hunt, would not back down. And those people turned out to represent interesting perspectives from inside a number of different uh, fields and other places in society. And what they had to say about what went on internally in those spots was uh, eye-opening. Now, I'd love to see it continue and to go further because to be sure we don't know the half of what we've got wrong and we are suffering all sorts of negative consequences for what we don't know and one of the one of the things that happened initially there was a real um flood of interest in the space uh in, t in particular in, in dialogues between some of the, the sort of core members of the idw and one of the the, the places that that published a lot of that Sorry, one of the places that hosted a lot of those was Pangburn originally. How, and then Pangburn, for those who don't know, had a kind of very public implosion, an event that they were going to do in New York didn't happen, but a, some of the events that they were going to do in, uh, I think, New Zealand and Australia also didn't happen. A lot of people didn't get their money back because of that. The Australia, Australia event did happen. The New Zealand event was cancelled and yeah. the New York event was cancelled. And there were a lot of people who didn't get their money back. There was a lot of, um, how important do you think that failure by Pangburn was f for this sort of, what felt like a, a real trajectory towards kind of um, in-person events, a lot of high profile encounters between some of these, the IDW members. And that seems to have tailed off almost completely after Pangburn failed. How important do you think that was to the trajectory of the, of the IDW? Uh, unfortunately, I think it was tremendously important. There was something that Pangburn was doing, which was resulting in thousands of people showing up in one place to see conversations that nobody knew what the outcome would be, and that was very healthy. The way Pangburn explored that space was very destructive because effectively, and I don't really know exactly what he was doing, but he appeared to be um, gambling. He would create events and then see if they filled. And if they didn't, he would cancel them. And he would depend on future events to produce enough money to create refunds. And so there were some events that were canceled that people did get refunds for. And then there was a point at which the business model collapsed and refunds stopped coming. Um, that was very costly to the IDW, that the reputation of this space was jeopardized by that reckless behavior. And I, I resent it um, because it did have that impact. Um, with that said, because Pangburn effectively showed how big the space was, I'm perplexed by the fact that something did not swoop in to pick up the ball he had dropped. Had that thing happened, 
I think we would still be seeing interesting conversations. And in fact, what conversations we are seeing would probably have changed over time, and they might be, you know, just as dynamic and interesting and surprising today as they were a couple of years ago. But um, that didn't happen, and there have certainly been some events since. But you're right; the interest in what was going on in the space and who disagreed with whom and where the state of their conversation was, that thing has uh, been atomized and now exists in much smaller forms. Now that said, there are other things emerging in this space. Eric and I now have separate podcasts uh, that have emerged in the space and they definitely don't serve the same purpose as having, you know, a, a theater full of people there for a discussion between between IDW members. But in any case, my hope is that the momentum that existed when those events were happening will be picked up by other things. Hopefully some of them will be events and some of them will take other forms. And uh, if things go well, then IDW space will morph, but it will, uh, it will continue. And would you, I mean, as you say, both you and Eric now have podcasts, which I think is a really positive development because what I also saw from the initial IDW formation was a slight imbalance because you're, you're, you're essentially then, some, some of those IDW members had ways to get their message out, others had to be mediated by other, by other platforms. Um, do you think that was one sort of failure condition for it as well? The fact that you were dependent on, for example, Rubin, Rogan, Sam Harris for actually getting the messages out? Um, I think, I, I'm not really sure. I mean, it's hard for me to see that as a negative because um, in my case, you know, I end up on Rogan's program four times. I was on Sam Harris's program, uh, Rubin's program three or four times. In any case, it wasn't an impediment for me to get my message out um, because they were interested in having those conversations. What has to happen now in order for the discussion to self-catalyze, I'm not sure. And certainly having more venues is potentially good, you know, and it is also true that the venues that existed are morphing and changing and uh, I'm not sure what the, the outgrowth of it. What I would say is probably the most important thing is for the space to be dynamic, that at any point that it becomes a thing that continues to deliver the same uh, sort of value, it will become boring and that that wouldn't be positive so i'm hopeful that a, a dynamic uh phase two emerges what do you think that dynamic phase two looks like well i think uh, one thing i hope to see are events that focus more directly on not just the brokenness of our common narrative but on particular things that have failed in uh quadrants of our larger discussion. So for example, I'm going to be having a debate with David Sloan Wilson very soon about uh, group selection versus what I call lineage selection. And the trouble with this event is that most people don't realize how much rests on the outcome of that discussion. It can seem kind of dry and academic. But when you realize that what's really under discussion is why we behave in the collaborative way that we sometimes do and why that fails. And that basically, if you want to live in a civilization that achieves the objectives that a highly collaborative civilization might, then you need to understand what it is that the driving force behind that collaboration is based on because it's a key feature of the architecture. So, um, in any case, I'm hoping that more discussions like that will happen where we confront a very narrow issue on which a great many, a great breadth of things depends and that people will begin to realize that that's, that's where the rubber meets the road. It's all well and good to find uh, heterodox thinkers who are bold enough to speak in public. It's another thing entirely to confront um, 
questions on which civilization hinges. Rebel Wisdom was set up to make sense of the world at a deeper level than the mainstream media. It was built for these times of crisis and change, which is why we want to do what we can to meet the challenge of the times. More films, and also for our Rebel Wisdom members, weekly sense-making calls with our amazing interviewees. And also, we're introducing the Wisdom Gym, a place to practice some of the skills that we've talked about on the channel. Thanks for watching, and see you soon.